Okay, so welcome to week four, everyone. Uh, this is going to be our last full lecture with you all because Wednesday is um, almost completely going to be devoted to your presentations. Um, so first off, I wanted to start with the reading discussion uh, for the GFI fermentation report. Um, so I hope you had a chance to read it. Uh, so can anyone tell me first, um, what are the three types of fermentation uh, categories that GFI has identified? <laughs> Did people get a chance to read the report? Might know no, one for class, if that's any help. Yeah, you, you, okay, so you might know at least one class because it's um, been half of the, it's half of cellular agriculture. <laughs> okay, so precision fermentation? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so then there's another one, which is um, what, what they categorize as uh, including sauerkraut, sourdough, uh, kimchi, tempeh, all of that other stuff that we see, that we have known from throughout cultures. So that's uh, traditional fermentation. Um, so traditional fermentation they define as using intact live organisms to process ingredients, um, resulting in different flavors and in preservation, um, as well as different nutritional profiles than the raw ingredients. Um, precision fermentation, they define as uh, using microbial hosts as factories to produce specific functional ingredients that may or may not be produced by the wild type strain or may not be, be produced um, in as large a quantity or as large a purity as the original wild type strain. And then the third, um, type of present of fermentation that they identify is biomass fermentation, um, where you are, it, where like it's instead of traditional fermentation where you're using microbes to change a raw material, um, and your most of what you're eating in the final product is that raw material um, that's been processed. Um, in biomass fermentation, you are eating the microbe itself as like the primary ingredient. So uh, this includes any sort of like fungi um, where like you are saying that fungi is a microbe um, and growing it up into a sort of alternative meat or you can think about air protein, which is a company that makes uh, a sort of a, a powder that looks kind of like soy flour, I believe. Um, that's high in protein and it's basically made of bacteria or microbes. Um, okay, <laughs> so can anyone tell me, give me some uh, new businesses within the field of fermentation? Um, I think that corn like, is one, like don't they do mycoprotein? Mm. Or, or <laughs> is this a different question? Um, so what are they using mycoprotein to do? Oh, I think it's just like make chick like chicken patties. Like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've seen that one on the shelves. Like it's marketed as mycoprotein, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So making alternative uh, meat products that kind of get the same texture as meat is, yeah, one of the businesses I found. Um. So I, uh, sorry, again, I didn't uh, read the article or the papers, but um, so um, so uh, the meaning of a question number two is kind of beyond culture meat, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like um, um, new businesses, like, um, like a gel tour, like um, collagen, mm -hmm. uh, making a collagen by fermentation. Um, and also some companies trying to produce um, feed stock um, for, for livestock, um, mm -hmm. like a, yeah, protein. This is also new businesses, I think, mm -hmm. uh, like a alternative or fish meal, fish meal. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes a um, 
vitamin or food ingredient as well. Yeah, so functional ingredients um, like gel tour, like, like gel tour's collagen um, are really important. So the, those includes en enzymes and vitamins um, that produce, give a new function to a food, but may not be found at in a high amount in the food. They may not make a, a huge percent of the final product, um, but they're hugely important to um, the function of the food overall. So Geltor is working on cosmetics right now, um, as well as uh, some nutraceuticals um, before they are moving towards food products. And then you also have yeah, feedstock, um, like uh, feeding livestock. But actually, uh, one of the things they talked about here in, in this report were uh, using fermentation to make pet food. Um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, there's, you can also make eggs, dairy, gelatin, seafood, um, all different products under fermentation, as well as palm oil, which is not an animal product, but um, the traditional farming of palm oil is still um, very environmentally intensive. Um, so we've, we're finding that we can produce palm oil through precision fermentation as well. And that might be a more sustainable alternative than farming out of palm trees. Yeah. Um, and then there's one way that precision fermentation, there, there's one, at least one way that uh, precision fermentation can be used uh, to benefit cultured meat. Does anyone remember? It has to do with media. Okay, to produce uh, the, the growth factors so exactly. that we won't need to use FBS in the media. Exactly. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and so that, yeah, that's, that's the applications for precision fermentation products that I found. Um, there are also different businesses that happening within fermentation um, that you're getting partnerships with larger companies um, who have the structure already in place to produce these products at a large scale. Um, and you also have some companies starting up that are not producing, are not selling products themselves, but are instead offering their services to optimize the process of someone's fermentation. Awesome. Uh, so question three, uh, what are the five steps in the value chain of fermentation or you know, five steps in development of a fermentation pr product? There's a handy diagram here that GFI has, I can find it in section six. I'll, I'll, can I, I'll share my screen for a bit. So the five steps um, for fermentation, or like the, can you think about like the five, um, some of the five departments in a fermentation startup or bit company that's devoted to the technological side would be feedstock optimization. Um, so what are you feeding your bacteria or my other microbes? Um, developing the strain of microbes that you're using um, and exactly what target molecule you want because you think because if you're thinking like, oh, I want my product to have um, to have I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a cheese and I want it to have a certain stretch. Um, you have to think about what molecule gives it the stretch that you want. Um, so that's target selection. And you have to think about bioprocess design. So making a bioreactor, um, uh, make, thinking about recycling and all that thing, all that. Um, and then finally, the formulation of the final product. Um, so uh, is this going to be a cosmetic face cream or a cheese or any of that other stuff? Um, and also food science will come into this. Cool. So those are the 
uh, about three questions that I have for you all. Sankita can start with some announcements. Yeah, I think we, we have a couple of announcements. So firstly, and we'll also mention this on Wednesday, uh, if you guys, um, <laughs> hopefully through within MIT, but if you want to collaborate as well, we can talk about that. Uh, if you want to help grow our group, please reach out to us at our email, cell-ag.organizers at mit.edu. Um, and we'd love to have work with you because we know you very well now um, to help grow our group. Yeah. And the next announcement is just that for class on Wednesday, which is actually not a class, it's just going to be our final presentation. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is OK with people from our club who might want to join in to possibly view. you. Uh, if people are not okay with that, we you can just send us an email, it's no big deal at all, and we won't actually be publicizing it. But if there's no objections um, to it, then we'll invite some of the group members or you know, some part of MIT, also some alumni from MIT um, who just might be interested in this space. I think we have an announcement related to this also, which is, um, also, we would work, we're consider since we have all these recordings available um, of the class, we would like to make it as available to the public as possible. So we are considering making these lectures public, but we know that you have participated throughout these class and um, your face or name uh, might be on materials. So let us know also if um, you would not like to be shown um, on the class recordings and we can figure out uh, a way to either keep our recordings unlisted um, or edit you out of the video. Yeah, and let it uh, just email us at CELAG organizers if you have a problem. We're, ha uh, and we're happy to discuss or change what needs to be done to make you comfortable. Okay, yeah. Um, um, there are no would you yeah. Would you mind if I ask you one, one question about the cell arc, cell arc at MIT? So um, um, would it be possible to learn about a cell arc at MIT? I mean, what is the mission and what is the, what, yeah, I mean, the role or what was the goal or something like that? Yeah, so are you asking about just like what the group's mission and goal are? Y yes, yeah. Um, Sorry, I, yeah, the, I'm not familiar with cell ag at MIT. So just uh, in, in general, yeah, just uh, I would like to learn about that. Yeah, so we are the group that's putting on this course. Um, we're trying to become a student organization in the spring. And really our biggest goals are just to encourage uh, knowledge and research and career development within cell ag here at MIT. And, I mean, one of our longest, long standing goals is to bring research, real research from a professor uh, in this space. Um, but yeah, Emily, me, Adele, Megan, Jasmine, we're organizers currently. And so if you have any interest at all in bringing more activities like this to MIT, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, so, so far we have this class. Um, we're making grants. We have a website, LinkedIn, all that fun stuff. Uh, we've run a newsletter. Um, we have sort of run a journal club, but we'd like a new organizer to pick that up again. Um, we're make, running career fairs. Um, so we're doing a lot at MIT to spread awareness of this field, um, uh, educate students as well as professors and bring research to the university. I see, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, are there any more questions? All right, cool. We can go ahead and get started then. So today's topic is food science and this is the last lecture that we'll have um, this IAP course. So thank you all for being here um, and helping us learn as well at the same time. Uh, so food science is pretty important just because now we have cell ag, we've shown you how to make these products using cell ag. But even though this could be really good for the world and we see its impact and its value, um, unless we can actually cater these products to be as tasty, as nutritious, and as accepted by consumers, 
uh, we really can't have the full impact of cell lag. So food science is going to be pretty important in that design process. Uh, here are a couple of the topics we'll touch on today. Uh, let's get started with flavors. So flavors, just as a background, uh, you have two main physiological components to flavor. You have both the taste on your tongue, and you also have the aromas you can perceive through your nose. Um, and when you put all of those signals together, along with your own mental perception, you get what we call as flavor. So it's pretty complex sensory impression uh, that we can really design with. And when we think about flavor uh, characteristics, there are a number that we can talk about. You might be familiar with the five basic tastes, which are spicy or sour or bitter, salty and sweet. There's also the sixth, uh, which is called umami. And you might be familiar with this in the taste of mushrooms or just very earthy and meaty, savory, hearty foods. Uh, this is one in particular we really want to try to tap into with our development of plant-based proteins and cellular, cellular agriculture as meat. Um, but it's also important to notice that there are other components we don't usually associate with the tongue uh, that come in touch with developing flavor as well. And these are temperature and texture. So for example, if you were to eat pizza or pasta that is fresh and given to you at a restaurant, uh, how does it taste different from one that has been stored in the fridge overnight? Uh, so there's a lot of just variables at play that we can kind of understand to develop the best foods that we want. And so when we actually talk about the science of food, uh, it's tough because it's, you know, it seems pretty subjective, but there are some ways that we can also start to quantify and start to make this a little bit more objective. And so, especially with flavor, uh, when we wanna set up some sort of human study, we do what is called a taste panel. And so essentially what we have is we have people who are trained to recognize uh, the level of flavor. So for example, I can add a certain amount of hot sauce to five samples, like increasing the amount of hot sauce each time. The trained food tasters, the food panelists will be able to say, every time they taste the level three spicy, they'll be able to say, this is a level three spice, for example. And so they have this kind of standardization of their food like palate basically. And so when we give them new foods to taste, we can say, does this have a spice level of, what, what's the spice level? Or what is the salty level? Do you think it's too salty or not too salty? Um, and we can actually quantify this on something we call a spider chart. So you can have many different characteristics and you can kind of rank their dynamic uh, value between foods. Um, and this is a pretty well-known graphic for companies like Sensory Spectrum, which basically is a contract research organization for uh, people who are trying to set up food panels. And so when we take the human aspect of that, we can also think about the biochemical aspect of flavor. Um, at the core, anything that's responsible for a taste and the smell or the way you perceive a food's look uh, comes down to chemical compounds. So something that is very buttery usually has the same compound, which is called diacetyl. And we can actually identify these compounds through chromatography. So we talked a little bit about chromatography in the last downstream processing class where you have a column and you can actually have certain compounds come down that column. And based on the way they come out of that column, we can say things about what the structure of the compound might be. And so there are two types of chromatography that we usually talk about in terms of identifying flavor compounds, one called GCMS and another one called LCMS. All they stand for it is gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. And all that MS stands for is we have a machine that can essentially tell us exactly what the structure or very close to what the structure looks like. Um, so from that way, we can put together the data we have from people. We can also put together the data we have from what's actually in the compound itself. And if people perceive something to be really a certain taste, we can usually associate it to what compound is actually inside of the, comp of the food. And so in this way, it becomes pretty scientific and pretty um, 
objective in the sense that we know how to quantify flavor. Okay, so a very kind of important concept in food science, and especially when it comes to uh, meats, cultured meats, proteins, uh, there's a certain reaction that is known for causing browning or caramelization or just really just the cooking aspect of a lot of these foods that we were talking about. It's called the Maillard reaction. Um, essentially, when you have any sort of sugar or simple carbohydrate and amino acids, which are the backbone of proteins, you put those together and you heat them up around 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sorry, I really don't know how to convert that into Celsius on the top of my head. Um, we can put those together and we get what we're very, very fond to look for in cooking, which is this very kind of delicious looking brown color. And we've found that, you know, the guy that found this reaction actually found that most of these compounds are present in uh, this sort of cooked or roasted taste. Uh, so when we're talking about meat, especially, uh, this can be a really satisfying flavor. Um, so when we're developing new products, we wanna make sure that they can undergo this Maillard reaction pretty similarly uh, to what we know and what we consume in meats that already exist today. And this Maillard reaction is one of the main ways we can sort of add flavor or perceive flavor through cooking. And we'll talk about the second way uh, in the next section. Yeah, this is just a little bit of an example of some people who are working on plant-based protein and trying to change the taste from a little bit more chalky or more bean-like uh, to one that is more umami or more uh, resembling meat. Uh, we can really understand the compounds that are existing within the pea already, and then we can try to make them or modify them in a way that might make them cook much more like meat. Yeah, Bianca, we, uh, we're going to talk about lipid oxidation soon, uh, which goes hand in hand with the Maillard reaction and is, is pretty important in cooking as well. So yeah, great question. Um, another way that we can think about flavor and how we can bring new or interesting flavors into this uh, is fermentation. So we <laughs> talked about three types of fermentation. We've dove into precision fermentation for a good amount of time. And now we're just gonna talk about the fermentation you probably knew about before you even came and learn more about precision fermentation. And that's just traditional fermentation. Uh, so a lot of these foods and across cultures, really, we have many ways that we've started to uh, sort of integrate microbes and their sort of processes into the foods we eat. And those really come up with uh, the food that you start with versus the flavor of the food that you end with after fermentation can be a really dynamic difference and be something that seems very uh, homely or familiar to the palate. So um, companies have thought about trying to bring that to the alternative protein space as well. Um, and the modern food space, you can say in more generally. Uh, so for example, this is one company called Kingdom Supercultures and Megan, who is one of the organizers for Cell Ag at MIT, she's actually working here right now. Um, and this company is working on creating communities of microbes that can create new flavors or new food properties that we may just not have currently in our repertoire um, or rely very heavily on animals to do them. Uh, so yeah, just a little bit different than precision fermentation. This is not creating a very specific product, but they're rather combining new ways and new synergies of species to create just novel foods and flavors. Uh, so kind of an interesting design idea if anyone is um, intrigued by this. Okay, so our next section has to do with fats and fats are a very, very important part of, well, meat in general, as well as uh, a lot of the foods we eat in the way that they have properties. So I'm gonna first start off with a short clip from the world's first tasting of a cultured beef burger. This is from Mark Post's group, and he's actually in the video, but this is in 2013. And I want you to pay attention first to this scene that they start off with. They're pouring a pan, it's a blank pan, and they pour a little bit of oil. 
and they put the fatty on top of the oil. And I'm gonna like skip over to where she first starts to taste it. I can't hear her. Oh, you can't hear her? Let's see. Just move up the volume, perhaps. I was expecting the, the texture to be more soft. There's really a bite to it. Um, and there is quite some flavor with the browning. And I know there is no fat in it, so I didn't really know how, it's, how juicy it will be. Um, but there is quite some intense taste. It's close to meat. It's not that juicy. But um, uh, the consistency is perfect. Um, I miss salt and pepper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nicely put, Miss. So there were a couple of things that she mentioned in there, you know, she was really missing out on that juicy taste. Uh, she said she kind of wished there was more salt and pepper. Um, so for context, we've talked about this a little bit before, but the very first burger was entirely muscle. Uh, there's no fat in there, as she mentioned, and to cook with fat, they actually have to add oil into the pan. Um, now the world's first lab-grown cultured. Okay, yeah. So fats are really more than just tenderness. Um, we can add fat for tenderness just to cook, but the fat that is inbuilt in protein products and a lot of the foods we eat, it's a lot more than just juiciness or tenderness. Um, the structure of fats actually helps to reduce the vapor pressure of a lot of flavor compounds that are normally very volatile or can just associate into the air basically without us being able to perceive them. Um, and secondly, fats are hydrophobic, which means that a lot of these compounds that have flavor are also usually hydrophobic or aromatic is what they're called, which means that those will mix together and be incorporated very well um, within a product. It's not gonna separate out and leave you with something bland. Um, pretty interestingly, what they found with most meats currently is that the sort of protein or muscle uh, fraction of the meat uh, is really common and uniform in taste across many meats and even many species, but it's actually the fats, the fat tissue within the meat that gives a lot of different flavor, not just between species, but Wagyu steak versus a, a regional meat that is only cultured in France, for example. Uh, those sort of heirloom flavors are actually attributed mostly to the fat rather than the muscle. And so um, three types of basic fats that we can know about are the solid, usually room temperature at solid, solid at room temperature, um, saturated fats, which are essentially they're called saturated because all of the carbons have, are saturated with hydrogens. They have no uh, double bonds between carbons. And when we have a double bond, when those carbons are not fully uh, attached to all four hydrogens, we have something called a monounsaturated, or if there's more than one, a polyunsaturated fat. And these unsaturated fats, these two down here, these are actually going to be the ones that are most responsible for aroma. And they're actually usually found mostly on the membranes of cells. So not just adipocytes, but membranes of all cells. Um, whereas these saturated fatty acids are the ones that we think about in terms of storing fat uh, in tissue in a body. So yeah, we can talk a little bit more about these unsaturated fats. So this sort of double bond I talked about earlier uh, makes them more susceptible to being able to broken down into smaller parts. And that's the ones you end up perceiving in smell. Um, that's a process called lipid oxidation. And that's actually the second uh, most sort of important process and reaction we think about in terms of aroma um, when it comes to food products and especially meats. So um, if you ever had meat that has gone bad or you leave it out in room temperature, it starts to smell bad. Uh, it's actually lipid oxidation at play as well. It's just when we cook meats, um, we're able to create different types of breaking downs of lipid and those are usually the ones we associate with nice smells. So um, yeah, this is an example of, this is actually this compound 12-methyltridecanol is what we 
commonly have found through taste and sensory panels to be attributed to the smell of stewed beef. Um, so if you take out this compound, um, you don't smell that smell really much at all, but you can take out a couple of other types of fats and um, you can still sort of make the sense out that it's stewed beef in a flavor panel. So yeah, more than that even, uh, we can take those sort of lipid oxidation products, we can combine them with those Maillard products that we talked about before. And we get even more uh, different compounds and even more sort of characteristic smells and compounds we associate with just umami and delicious tastes within proteins. Um, a really funny example of this kind of combination of lipid oxidation and Maillard reaction is actually chicken and waffles. So when you fry a piece of chicken, uh, you've got the fats, the proteins, and the sugars, uh, as well as caramelization from the sugar in the waffle as well. Um, so all of these things kind of play out in really interesting ways and are somehow very pleasing towards the human palate. <laughs> yeah, so if we have fats, um, we know why they're important. How do we actually get them into our product? Um, so this is a photo of the, I believe this is the Impossible Burger. Um, and you saw earlier how she was pouring the oil into the pan for even the cultured muscle burger uh, from Mosa meat. Um, currently these burgers don't have a sort of encapsulated fat within them. We're gonna have to use some sort of coconut oil or refined solid fat that we can uh, actually put in a pan. And what actually happens you can kind of see here, uh, all of the fat is just not really, again, incorporating itself into the burger, into the product. So one way we can fix that, um, ideally, is to actually grow a co-culture of adipocytes within the culture of myocytes. So something like a Wagby steak, for example, uh, is able to kind of have this really nice marbling and really good co-culturing that can retain its structure so while cooking, you're not gonna just have all the fat leak out, basically. And uh, there have been a number of people and players who have tried to accomplish this. Uh, most notably, Mission Barnes and Piece of Meat are two companies that have worked on cultured fat. So they have made some forays into actually creating like a purified version of cultured bacon and duck fat. Um, and kind of an interesting place for them is they're trying to see if they can incorporate these cultured fats with plant-based products for the flavor. Um, for the actual incorporation of structure, uh, some groups are working on kind of the foundational elements of co-culture. So for example, Dr. Amy Rowett's group, specifically I think Stephanie Kowacki, PhD student at UCLA, she's working on creating scaffolds that can house two types of cells at the same time. So both myotubes and the adipocytes together. And yeah, it's, a, it's definitely, if we're having some challenges with cultured meat, um, there's even more to say with uh, co-culturing. And this can do with plant-based pro products, but in general, when we want to try to, uh, you know, not just mix, but actually have some sort of encapsulation of the fat within a product, we can think about emulsification. Um, so especially in things like milks, uh, what we can do to keep a mixture from basically separating out from water and fat at the bottom, uh, we can make really, really small microstructures that house the fat and those are mixed in really well amongst the water droplets. Uh, so one group, which is, I think that UMass Amherst, yeah, Dr. Julian McClements, he's working on creating micelles uh, that are plant-based and can house vitamins within milk. And we'll talk a little bit more about his work. Uh, another group, which is the Alt Meat Lab at UC Berkeley, they have found a type of plant, kiaha, that is able to form these sort of nano emulsions and in the center house some oils. Um, so this can be a good way that we can think about putting things into liquid formulations or even plant-based proteins. And Emily mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, some of Adil's friends actually work on a uh, sustainable palm oil that is coming through precision fermentation. So just for fun, thought we could talk a little bit about that. Um, 
yeah, you know how this technology works essentially, and it's really cool how you can see that impact play out. Okay, yeah, so that's a little bit on fats. Um, we, our next topic is gonna be nutrition. Um, so now that we have our products and they taste good, how can we make sure that they're equivalent and they meet the nutritional needs that people see from them that keeps them there? Um, so when we take a step back and we think about the ways that we've talked about how to make replacements for animal products, um, in some cases it can work out really well for us. So for example, with precision fermentation, when we wanna make a creamy milk or whey, um, we can just make that whey and mix it in with some other ingredients and we have dairy products that are lactose and cholesterol free. And that can be a really good thing for some people. Um, on the other hand, it can also have shortcomings when we sort of isolate this part from the whole. Uh, for example, when we make cultured beef or cultured meat, uh, we don't naturally get vitamin B12 within the meat itself. And that's because B12 is synthesized by gut microbiota within the animal. Uh, so when we think about cultured beef, we're gonna have to actually supplement it with B12 that we make from other microbes um, if we wanna have that property. Yeah, another really sort of important characteristic when we think about that fortification aspect, when we just want to add something into our product is how bioavailable is the form or what is the form that we can best absorb that product. So um, iron, uh, for example, comes in two forms in foods that we eat. Uh, one is called heme iron, and this is the kind that we find usually from animal products. Uh, it consists of an iron atom but it also has this protoporphyrin ring, protoporphyrin ring, um, which is, it really helps with the uptake into our blood and circulation within our hemoglobin in the cells. Um, when we have food that is not animal-based, so a lot of, for example, cereals uh, might be fortified with your 100% RDA of iron. This comes in a form that is known as non-heme, which is essentially just the atom itself or the ion itself. And um, this form is not only less, it's a little bit harder for our body to actually uptake, but based on the foods that we combine it with or the way that we get this non-heme iron can actually deter or slow down the absorption process um, of that iron altogether. So um, for example, if you take non-heme iron, um, let's say you have a bowl of lentils, um, <laughs> take a bowl of lentils and you serve it with vitamin C. Now, vitamin C has been found to really up the intake or how available the iron is to you because it can kind of protect that iron atom as it moves through your digestion and everything. However, um, if you're planning to get your iron from spinach, uh, spinach has a couple of compounds like polyphenols and calcium that actually really mess with the iron atom and uh, react with it in ways that don't allow it to be used for all of your body processes. So bioavailability is kind of key when it comes to thinking about how we want to fortify our foods. How are we actually going to get that into you? And just to elaborate on that a little bit, um, three of the sort of factors that play into this bioavailability is one, we talked about the form, which is just bioaccessibility. So like heme iron versus non-heme iron. And then absorption and transformation really have to do with, you know, the processing through your body. Um, I put this photo of <laughs> this like very advanced whey powder, 60 grams of protein per serving. Um, I think a couple of studies have come out that have shown that really your body can really only absorb 30 grams of protein in one sitting. So chugging down this huge protein shake all at once may not be the most um, as effective as you think it will be. Um, in terms of how much you absorb that protein. Yeah, so how do they actually determine these things? Well, before they jump into in vivo models and later uh, human trials, uh, what they can actually do is simulate the various compartments of your GI tract using mixtures of different pHs and different enzymes. Um, so if you can see right here, I had to take this from video, so it's a little bit shorter, uh, smaller. Um, we have like a mouth flask, which has some amylases and different 
uh, peptidases in your mouth. And then also page two becomes your stomach and your small intestine and your colon. And then we can actually look at our compound after it's been processed through this GI tract and see you know, how much of that uh, leftover material is still bioaccessible. So for example, how much of that iron is still in the heme form. Um, and this again is from Dr. McClements who is working on looking at how we can improve almond milk for a dairy, dairy alternative. And so his work is trying to see, can we fortify it with vitamin D and calcium? And they actually found that the vitamin D and calcium when they fortify almond milk starts to form this precipitate soap, which uh, you can absorb and it just goes out through your urine. Um, so may not actually be helpful to do both in one, uh, in this one formulation. So yeah, those are just a few things that hopefully next time you see something um, that makes you sort of question this nutrition, you know how to conduct, you know how to sort of contend with that. Uh, this is one product that recently very recently just started its pre-ordering. Uh, it's called the Astrius Truffle. And it, I think it was originally created with the idea of designing food for space, but essentially it has 100% RDA of most of the essential micronutrients you need. So vitamins, minerals, um, and it's in the form of a chocolate truffle. Um, but it just makes you wonder, you know, is all of that really being absorbed? And these are kind of the questions they have to contend with. You can buy it, by the way, for $18 if you live in California. I don't think they ship outside of California right now, <laughs> but they're out of stock. <laughs> um, yeah, so our last section is going to be marketing, and we touched on this a little bit in our last class. Uh, so we'll just continue a little bit about that because it has a lot to do with the way that people choose and actually end up buying their foods. Um, so couple of factors that have been really important for people. The top three are taste, price, and convenience. Um, along with that, there are other things that are more secondary, so health and wellness, safety, social impact, um, and experience. And some of these things are kind of what we're touching on uh, keyly in cell ag and alternative proteins. So just good to know that it's not really, may not be the first thing in people's minds um, when we're designing. Um, yeah, there has been a number of studies that have looked at just the way people perceive and want to think about cultivated meat, and we've touched on a little bit of those. Um, but there are, is not really surprisingly a clear way that is a give all take all for people. So if we completely market cultivated meat as the ethical or the most ethical, and we start to develop it as the most ethical product, um, that might not be the most forefront of someone's mind. Um, so this kind of, I think, defines the cultivated meat landscape in that many companies are kind of trying to even make it a reality and they might take different emphases or different special approaches to developing their product. Um, and they'll still have an audience for that. Yeah. yeah, and along with the health considerations, this was actually a pretty good uh, book it's not really quite a book, but it's a very short publication by Chris Gosterados of Cellular Agriculture Society. He basically just gives 90 reasons to consider cell ag. And this is kind of a few of those in relationship to health um, that you can think about. So I think also it's important to note here that um, the term lab grown meat or the idea of something you grow in the lab as being unhealthy for you uh, these are just a few of these sort of advantages that you can communicate to those people, as well as start to contend with yourself, you know, where can we actually make improvements over currently what exists. Um, and I know that currently, you know, things like the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger, they're often, you know, complained to be not, they're not that much healthier over like a traditional burger, right? Like they still have a lot of fat, a lot of this, etc. It's important to note that these products weren't necessarily created with the idea of this is going to be a healthier burger. Uh, it was just created as a reason for people to make a substitution for something that could be environmentally not as friendly. Um, but with cellular agriculture in particular, these are some health considerations we can actually um, think about and say, hey, these are actually some advantages we could have. 
And the same goes for environment. Um, I could go on and on about <laughs> how many statistics there are on how much better a cell lag could be for the environment. Um, but if these kinds of analyses are, are interesting to you, uh, there are something called LCA, or life cycle assessments or analyses uh, that you can definitely look into and, and start to paint a better picture for you or anyone you're trying to communicate to about cell lag. And I guess our next topic has to do with just sort of the uh, controversy or even just problems that cell lag could face, um, not even cell lag, plant-based meat as a first starting point could place as an alternative to a conventional meat. Um, at this, so marketing we've talked about a little bit has been a problem before. Uh, we wanna be accurate, but we also don't want to scare people away with uh, a very unfamiliar um, sort of way that we describe our products. And so when Tuferki, which is a plant-based company, vegan uh, meat alternatives company talks about labeling their vegan deli meat as just that, like a plant-based deli meat, uh, that has run into some problems with some states. Um, so it looks like we're still trying to uh, go through this sort of delegation and decide really what's the best way for us to name our products and yeah, these are, I think we've showed this a little bit before, but there are a number of ways, and we even talked about it a little bit in class, um, what is the best way we can call our products, um, or what is the best way we can tell our friends about these products. But hopefully, through this course, you've picked up new ways of even just talking about them to your friends, your loved ones, uh, hopefully just astounding, uh, erasing, not erasing, what's the word, dispelling some fear. Um, over maybe what might be some sort of misconception about cultured meat or precision fermentation or cell lag in general. Um, and we really enjoyed having you guys learn, but this is officially our last class slide. A um, few more announcement slides, but yeah, move on to this one. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, quite a hallmark. Um, so next class, uh, it's your turn to give us some presentations. Um, so a rundown of what's going to go on. Uh, we ask that you have a 10, prepare a 10 to 12 minute presentation. Um, you'll have 15 minutes total before I'll have a timer to ask you to move on um, to the next person. Um, so 10 to 12 minutes of presentation, three to five minutes of uh, people being able to ask you questions about your presentation. Um, we also ask that you submit your paper and I, I think you should also submit any slides if you have them uh, by Friday 1 p.m. EST to your project folder. Um, I've prepared um, a sample presentation for you all and I think Jasmine prepared a sample paper proposal um, to give you some examples of what we're looking for. Um, so those might be helpful. Next slide. Um, and we are giving you incentives to prepare these pr presentations. Um, so we'll have four prize, prize categories. Um, you can get prizes for most appetizing presentation, most re best researched, most creative, and most impactful. Um, we will all be judging the presentations together. I'll have a survey ready for you all to judge um, to choose our winners. And the prize will be, for the winners will be um, this beautiful uh, Brave Robot ice cream that you see here. Next. And then even if you don't win one of those prizes, um, you can have as a consolation prize uh, this in vitro meat cookbook that I think we presented maybe in the crash course, um, but it's a beautiful, a uh, cookbook of recipes you can't make right now, but um, it's a beautiful design process. Uh, I, I really like this book myself. Yeah, I think we have a few more slides. So to help you get prepared for the presentation, we're going to be available for office hours um, today after class right now, um, as well as Tuesday, I think 9 p.m. EST. Um, 
both of those office hours will be on the same Zoom link as class, same Zoom link as the previous office hours we've had for class. Um, if those, if neither of those office hours work for you, um, you can email us at celagorganizers at mit.edu uh, and we can figure out a time to meet or you can just email us for any questions you have. Next slide. Um, and then if once you do have your presentation, um, it would be really great if uh, you wrote us a short, like one paragraph blurb about your presentation and we're going to gather these all together um, within our website uh, where we'll have a web page of all the lecture materials um, as well as what presentations you all have worked on because we're excited to show your research. Yeah, I think that's all of the slides. So. This time is for you all to ask questions. How are everyone's presentations and papers going? <laughs>